really happy to see each one of you and meet you this way. Hi to the ones on Zoom land and hello to the ones that we are meeting today on YouTube as well. Uh, well, um, this evening, and I heard that uh, it is it was raining there, Linda said, and it's raining here as well. So we hope for the best and uh, looking forward to the monsoon, actually. Uh, thank you, Livia, Gladdy, and Ethan for reading the scripture portions very well. And um, uh, I'm going to show you guys uh, a few slides. And, um, and I'm going to... Uh, I mean, I, I just want to see if you can recognize maybe a few of them. Maybe you can recognize all of them. Okay. So I'm just proceeding to show you a few slides. Okay. Let's see how many you know. Do you know the people in this slide? And if you do, you can start naming them. Uh, feel free to shout it out loud. How many ever you get? Of course, there's no price. But uh, the next time I see you, candy is coming your way. Yeah, there are a few Indians here as well. Uh, are you able to see, look around? Yeah, the mic can go out or just shout out. That's fine as well. Uh, I can't hear you because that is on mute as of now. Jeez, uh, the, the camera part is on mute, so I can't hear you. But uh, Praveen? Uh, I can't hear you. I'm thinking that's Clemmy uh, from the camera angle, but the audio is muted here uh, for GCI India. Yes, now I can hear you. I think. Please go ahead. But I'm hoping we missed someone in the pictures. General knowledge, huh? questions and quiz. Check, check. Yes, now I can hear. Rishi Sonak. Oh, wow. One of the um, Indians worldwide now, right now, the Prime Minister of the UK. Yes, you're right. Okay, who else? Name one Indian who is in India. President Mumru. Murmu. <laughs> okay, and the top prize goes to Clemmy, but now somebody else other than Clemmy. Malala. Ah, there you go. So you guys know your history, you know your uh, gender knowledge. I'm going to show you one more slide. Let's see if you know these four gentlemen. Do you know who these four people are? Xi Jinping. Okay, yeah, just shout out the answers. No problem. Xi Jinping, yes. Well, who else? Bill Gates. Bill Gates. Very well done. Okay, I think you guys are top notch. 100 marks for you guys for GK. Okay, wonderful. Give a clap for yourselves. Come on, go ahead. Give a clap for yourselves. And if you didn't know, please ask Clemmy for all the answers in the slide, okay? All right. But I, I do have a, a discussion question for you. And of course, the microphone will come on, uh, come near you. Uh, I would like to hear your answer for this. And so feel free, adults and even teenagers. Uh, and I'd love to hear what you have to say, okay? So the discussion question is this. If you were given an option of whether you want to be wealthy or famous or powerful, which one would you choose and why? So in a short way, choose one and also say, why would you like to be that? Can I have a few volunteers? One or two. Is it difficult choosing among the three? We would love all the three, wouldn't we? But if you were to choose one, that's the hard part. Which, if you were to choose one, if God comes and says, choose one, what would you choose? I'm sure the Lord is gracious in all, but if you were given a choice to choose one, what would you choose? I think uh, wealthy because the wealthy are famous and powerful too. Okay, thank you, Selena. As I said, no right and wrong answers. Well done. Okay. Anyone else? One more. What about the young people? One of the young ones. The, the young ones don't want to choose. Yes, Sona. As you are going to go now on to you know, future um, careers and stuff like that. What would you like to choose? 
I would like to choose wealthy. Okay, and why? As Vikyaka said the same thing, and it would be powerful also. Okay, well, thank you so much for that answer. Thank you for participating in the discussion question. I truly appreciate that. And so, if you see this particular topic, this particular topic is important to us, isn't it? As we are taught in this world from our early years, through news, through culture, life experiences, that wealth, fame, and power are associated with success and that we have to attain them and anyhow possible and by any means necessary. We are taught from childhood by our parents, grandparents, relatives about the many benefits of being wealthy, famous and powerful in today's times, isn't it? And so that we need to achieve them. Well, longings and uh, striving for power, status, fame and recognition is a very common feature of everyday life, isn't it? But truth be told, there are many facets to this. There are many pitfalls to actively pursuing wealth, fame and power, especially without the guidance of God. And so let's quickly look at what are these, how are these three words defined? To be wealthy means having plentiful supply of everything a person needs, having an income, uh, investments, affluence or valuable possessions. To be famous means the state of being known or talked about by many people, especially about our notable achievements, being at the center of focus and having a reputation. To have power is defined as the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others or the course of events in a timely manner. I just wanted to find out what are these words in Telugu. And I saw, of course, I went to a, a Telugu guru, uh, Dr. Elizabeth, and uh, she told me it is uh, Dhanamu, Kirti, and Palukubadi. And that was a real mouthful, so I'm not ever going to use those words again. But just uh, a quick disclaimer that I want to give before we dig deeper into this particular topic. This sharing is not about whether we as Christians should have these three or not have these three. There is a place for power, status, glory, and recognition. In fact, power and authority is important in God's order and in the effective functioning of society, church life, and God's kingdom. Would you agree with me? I can see a few heads nodding there. Thank you for that response. Let's quickly bow down our heads and let's pray before we dig deeper into this topic. Father God Almighty, thank you, Jesus, for this day, for this time that you set uh, apart for us, O Lord, to come to your throne of grace and mercy and to look to you, O Lord Jesus, and to what you have to say. Father, we thank you that you have prepared our hearts to hear from you and to hear your voice, Father. And so we pray that you'll help us to keep our focus on you that you'll help us to hear your voice, that you'll help us, O oh Lord, what is on your heart. And Lord, as you've chosen me today, Lord Jesus, as a medium to bring your voice and your uh, message to your people, our Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will be with me. And Lord, help me to only speak what you've placed in my heart for your people, nothing more and nothing less. And Lord, Lord God, our Master, we pray that you'll have firm control over everything that we say here and we hear. Lord and Master, let your word take deep root and Lord and Master, that we would be transformed, the Lord Jesus, as we step out of this church hall or we step out of this service today. Thank you, Lord. Have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Genesis 1, 27 to 28, Adam is given a commandment where God says, fill the earth and govern it. Now, the account of Genesis 1 and 2 makes it very clear that God planned for humanity to enjoy the beauty and the abundance of creation. God created man to rule and have dominion over creation in the Garden of Eden, which was a fertile and a rich place. And humanity was intended to prosper in every sense as God provided an abundance of resources and means for humans to flourish. So, 
God has no problem with his children being wealthy, famous and powerful. It's good for us to remember this. So in this study, we will aim to redefine the significance of wealth, fame and power in the life of a Christian. We will aim at looking at these three objectives. First being God's definition and desire of having these three and what are the challenges that would come having these three elements in our life and a Christian's practical outlook to having these three elements in life. Now let's quickly look at the first one. God's definition and desire concerning wealth, fame and power. God desires that people have all these three in their life that they have the capacity for. Or in other words, God assigns wealth, fame and power to those who have the ability to control them or can handle them well. Seems a little controversial. Let's dig deeper. In Matthew 5, 25 verses 14 to 30, we read about the parable of the talents, isn't it? And we see that three servants over there were given different amounts of talents or currency by the master. And uh, they were given according to the capacity that they have to handle it because the master knew the servants very well. Like all the talents belong to the master, of course. And likewise, the whole wealth that we see and we have belongs to the Lord and it comes from God. But to each one of us, he gives us according to our capacity to handle because he knows each one of us. Now, the prodigal son, before he had a change of heart, he was given everything by his father. But did he have the capacity or the understanding of what he has been given or the ability to handle the wealth that he's been given, the fame and influence that he has in the right way? He didn't. And that is why he lost everything. So it's good for us to recognize that wealth belongs to God along with everything and everyone on earth, as we see in Psalm 24, 1. So it's good for us to accept that God, who runs everything in this world, sets a limit on how wealthy, famous or powerful each one of us should be. And according to his measure, he sets it. According to the plans he has for you and for me, he sets it. The problem arises when we try and up that measure that has been set by God. Or problem arises when we try and increase that measure that has been set by God. A meaning when greed and covetousness, uh, atyasha and durasha sets in. So we may all want to be Ambani's in life. But if we were given all that wealth and that fame and that influence, do you think you and I will have that capacity to control and handle it well? Or would we be like the prodigal son who had no clue and so lost out everything at the end and went into bankruptcy we read about many wealthy and famous and powerful characters in the Bible. As we see in Genesis 13, 1 to 2, the Bible itself notes that Abraham was a very rich man, right? So God has given wealth in the past to many people. He has been gracious to man from the time of Adam and he continues to be even now. And so God still assigns wealth, fame and power in today's time too but according to his will. Also, if God is not at the center of our life, then unmanaged wealth, fame or power, whether we think we have more or whether we think we have too little, they have a way of mastering over us and derailing our life. Let me say that once more. If God is not at the center of our life, then unmanaged wealth, fame and power, whether we think we have more or whether we think we have been given less, they have a way of mastering over us and derailing our life. We will only live a meaningful life, brothers and sisters, and we will be able to enjoy our wealth, fame and power if it is within a healthy relationship with our creator, the giver of all things. And he brings structure and form on how to enjoy these three elements in our life. Now, we all know about King Solomon. He was a very wealthy man. 
he was in fact his net worth was much bigger than the billionaires that we have today he was famous he was powerful and he's noted as the wisest man ever and in ecclesiastes 2 1 he says come on let's try pleasure he said to himself let's look for the good things in life he thought but solomon here says but i found that this too was meaningless so all wealth and fame or power should be sought after, but only within the parameters of God's will and plan that he has set for our lives to give it the real meaning. Let's quickly look at our second objective, the challenges that come with having wealth, fame and power in our lives. Now, there are many problems and conflicts while we handle these three elements in our life. Challenges come from societal structures where the rich are automatically tended to become richer, the poor become poorer, people use ill means to become um, famous, and people who have been given the power misuse it for their own selfish reasons instead of helping others. And we're seeing this in our country too, isn't it? And so the now wealth we know can be defined as the long-term sustaining levels of money either in, in, in different forms, either in cash and, and material possessions. Now, the challenge is that many things are not in a person's control. The means of sustaining or maintaining the same level of a bank balance every day or our net worth or our material wealth may not be within one's capacity. That's a challenge. And so to maintain the same level, many people may fall into Satan's trap. Now, what are the means or methods that we have employed to maintain our levels of bank balances? That is a question we need to ask ourselves. Are they good methods or are they questionable methods? Uh, or is are we unconsciously uh, going ahead with any under the table dealings is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Are we coming under the heavy foot of heavy borrowing from banks or anyone else to maintain our businesses in such a way that may in future lead us toward extreme debt? That is a question that we must ask. Are we borrowing too much on EMI and overspending our finances that we may go into debt later? These are the questions we need to ask ourselves because no company, no person or no office will do the same amount of business each and every day, isn't it? Business may upar niche hota hi hai, right? You need an example, you look at the stock market. It's very, very unstable. So by trying to maintain our levels of power and wealth that we think we should have, there is a heavy chance that our greed may make us sin. In fact, in greed, Christians unfortunately cheat other Christians too sometimes. And even God, when it comes to giving back to the Lord in terms of tithes or offerings or donations or in any other form, foolishly thinking that we are guarding our wealth. But the Bible warns us in Luke chapter 12, 50, it says, beware. Guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Next, fame is about being well-known and highly recognized, we said. Now, famous people are known because of what they do, what are the clothes they wear, their art, talents, maybe even their cars and the homes that they live in. And some are very famous for all the wrong reasons. I don't know uh, if you've ever heard of Ted Bundy. He was a very good looking and a smart, educated man in, in the US and he became very famous for being a horrendous serial killer. Michael Jackson, we all know him, right? He was a famous, famous singer and he was famous for his dance moves and his songs. But nearer to his death, he became even more infamous for allegations as a child abuser. One of our famous actors who still plays a hero in today's movies, he is infamous for allegedly shooting and killing a black buck and running over pedestrians on a footpath. Another well-known man of God who passed away, but who was excellent at apologetics. Personally, he brought many atheists to Christ and he is now more famous for his alleged uh, extramarital affairs. Nowadays, with social media, 
you do a short reels. We see, we all see reels, right? If we do a short reel on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube, we all can become a viral star. And the more likes and the comments we get, even if it is about something embarrassing or shocking, the bigger the star we become, we get paid more uh, as a content creator or as a influencer. Because the only way people maintain their fame and relevance is by being in the public eye constantly, as audiences of late have a short span of attention. And so for them, any publicity is good, even negative publicity, because their brand power is it's still going to be seen and talked about. And so if you notice at an airport, Anna, airport may we see all the pictures of all of these media celebrities, all the uh, you know media people, press people are going around them and pestering them. Madam, madam, one picture, madam, 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 one, uh, sir, sir, one picture, sir, sir, either they care, sir, either they care, and pictures lene ke liye aate hai. Have you seen? You must have all seen that, right? Now, did you know that those media people are actually paid for by the celebrities' own PR team to come and do all that action while the celebrities act as if they are being followed? Now, it is a very well-known fact and you can Google it. They do this to stay relevant and to keep up their popularity. And companies pay money to them to wear certain clothes at the airport. And so the next day after the pictures go up, uh, after the airport trip, those very clothes suddenly are trending. And the sales go up, the celebrities make money, the companies also make money. So there's a hidden agenda there. The world, my brothers and sisters, is very happy to come and do every sort of acting for us. They will even bring a garland or two for us if we are willing to pay them money. But contrary to the world as Christians, God asks us to be famous, yes, but for the right reasons, so that we may leave the right legacy as followers of Christ for our following generations. And our fame is to be used for what? To make known Jesus and his gift of salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, the another challenge would be that times and seasons change. They wait for none, isn't it? Notoriety and public recognition can fade. And even the most famous person is forgotten. Exodus 1.8 has actually a story which is very, very similar. And perhaps that is why it is written. It says that a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph or what he had done. Now, can you imagine that a wise and honored and an awarded ruler like Joseph, who was recognized as the person who saved generations of Egypt from famine, he was simply put aside and forgotten. How many of you know Rajesh Khanna, right? All your years must have perked up listening to him. Yes, I'm sure if you ask the present generation, they will say Rajesh Khanna who, right? But we knew him as a, uh, as a very popular actor at one point. But today, simply put aside and forgotten. Brothers and sisters, the question is, what do you and I want to be famous or recognized for? If people hear your name and my name, what will they associate our name with? Would we still stand out and be talked about who or how we are three generations down the line? You know, jo Joshua and Caleb, those two uh, Israelite spies, they could have easily gone out with the, with the public opinion of the other 10 spies, right? They would have received praise equivalently for their courage, but they stood for God's truth. And so they and their generations became famous for doing what is right in God's sight. What about us? Now, power is the ability to rule or influence over people, we said. But what if this power or influence is obtained or asserted in the wrong way? Now, there is the challenge. Our God is a God of order and it is his desire that there is power to maintain peace and order, right? Secular power as well as spiritual power. Romans 13.1 tells us that secular authority is in line with God's will and that we should submit to it. And in like manner, failure to recognize and submit to proper spiritual authority is also a serious matter. 
let us look at one biblical character who had the problem of greed in the area of acquiring power. He was Simon the Sorcerer. And we read about his story in Acts 8 uh, verses 9 to 24. And of course, we read these verses in the scripture reading portion. Now, Simon had this problem much before he became a believer. Even after his conversion, we see the problem persisted. Simon had this longing for greatness, recognition, fame, and prestige. He achieved this desire by practicing magic and astonishing people. And he clearly enjoyed the attention that was given to him. Although this power came from powers of darkness, Simon was not concerned because he was more interested in the darkness, in the attention he was getting, in the sense of greatness and the power he was enjoying that was coming his way. Now, if you look at these verses that uh, we read in the scripture portion, I have highlighted verse number 20. I want you to pay attention to verse 20 here, where Peter rebukes Simon the sorcerer and he says uh, he shows him saying that you have uh, the, you don't have the seriousness uh, and you have not taken these uh, these wrongful desires seriously Simon the sorcerer was rebuked so harshly by Peter right now it definitely seems this is a little out of place why is Peter being so harshness didn't God say be gentle and be kind but it was fitting for this occasion because Peter points out points out the wrongful desires that were there in Simon's heart such wrongful desires can result in bondage and they are very difficult for us to come out of these bondages can express themselves whether in our work or personal life and even in our Christian context. Now, today we may view Simon the Sorcerer as a terrible person as we read the story, but it serves as a warning for you and for me, brothers and sisters. Many people wrongly feel that once we start believing Jesus and we take baptism, we will magically turn into someone else. It is not so, isn't it? Jesus touches our heart, yes. But it is our response with the help of the Holy Spirit that we give to use our free will to choose to become like Jesus. And then he will guide us in our complete transformation, leading to the life of abundance that God desires for us. The kind of wrongful desires that we may have can be very strong and deeply hidden in our hearts and they can be manifested. Okay, we could be, it could be a hidden desire for recognition that even the person who is harboring it may not be conscious of. So we need to watch out for these and we have to check ourselves before God and confess and repent where needed. Now, then basic question would be, how do we tell if we have such wrongful desires, isn't it? First, if we can know, if we are enthusiastic about doing something when others are watching, but we are not so motivated to do that very same thing when no one is watching us, that is an indication of having wrongful desires. A second indication would be if we become upset or unhappy when other people do not show the recognition and appreciation that we expected or desired. Believe me, when I was putting these uh, the thoughts that were that were being formed in my heart through the Holy Spirit, it was hard. I had to submit myself and say and confess and say, yes, as a human, we all have these, isn't it? But it is good for us to keep our, our heart in check. And so uh, wrongful desires affect our whole walk with God. And instead of recognizing this problem, within our hearts and dealing with it in the right way, we get angry sometimes with those who might point out this to us in love. So these wrongful desires have negative effects on our heart. Let's quickly look at another example. Jesus loved his disciples and we know this. He spent time with them to teach them and to nurture them. Yet, even in them, this desire for power was there. That too, just before God, Jesus' crucifixion. We have read about this again from Luke 22, verses 21 to 27. And the occasion was the Lord's Supper. 
And Jesus was telling his disciples about his imminent betrayal. And at such a solemn and serious time as this, where Jesus was speaking of somber things, of what was to come, in verse 24, as I have, I have highlighted here, you can see that the apostles were fighting among themselves about who was the greatest. And the way Jesus responds in verses 25 to 27 clearly shows that the apostles were not engaged in an innocent discussion at that time. It clearly shows that there was something wrong, some garbage in their hearts. The word dispute here in the verse indicates that there is a wrong spirit in them. And Jesus, rightly reading their hearts at that moment, he told them that what they were doing was not the way of God's kingdom. Jesus pointed out to disciples the correct way, which is the spirit of humility, having the heart of a servant, even when we are all famous, even when we are all powerful, even when we are all wealthy. And that is the example Jesus set for his disciples and even to us today. It is helpful for us to reflect on the Lord's conduct, spirit and the way he lived his life. Now Jesus, by the way, was tempted with these very three elements, wealth, fame and power by Satan on the mount. And he overcame by having the right attitude towards these three and speaking the truth in scriptures. So, is it powerful to rule or lead people without caring or loving them? Is it possible? The answer is a resounding no. True greatness goes together with true humility as Jesus. So, if there is a place for power and recognition according to God, where then does the problem lie? The heart of the problem is our own exaltation of self-pride and self-gratification. God created you and me, brothers and sisters, with the ability to be successful. In knowing and obeying God, we find true fulfillment and success. Deuteronomy 8.17 says that God did all of this so that you and I will never say to ourselves, I have achieved this wealth or this power, or this money by my own strength and energy. So that we may never say like this, it is important for us to find true fulfillment and success in God. Quickly, let's run to our third objective, which is Christian's practical outlook towards wealth, fame, and power. We see the first outlook should be that success can be difficult to achieve, and at times, very addictive. Now, everyone strives for success, yet some people are left feeling like a failure because they are not happy to what to call uh, success and what to call as a failure. And very rarely, brothers and sisters, we find people who are satisfied or content with what's been given to them in terms of wealth, fame, and power. And in fact, Genesis 13, 10 to 11, we see the story of Abraham and Lot, right? Abraham lo brought Lot with him to Canaan. But what made Lot part ways was the wealth that he desired for himself. Lot saw the plains of Jordan and he chose to make wealth for himself in a place where the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were too materially aligned and morally bankrupt. And we know, right? We know what happened to Lot and his family at the end. So question is, where have you and I aligned ourselves? And to whom to achieve our success? Where have you and me aligned? And to whom to achieve our success? Jane Hunt, she is a very popular Christian author and she put it beautifully. She said, whether you have a great deal of money or very little, until you really believe that money in your possession is not your money, but God's money, your finances will likely always 
be a source of discontentment. Now, in the place of money, you can put fame, you can put influence, you can put prestige uh, and recognition. And this is why the Bible warns us from Hebrews 13, 5. It tells us, don't, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God, the, the ruler of heaven and earth, he said, I will never fail you and I will never abandon you. Another practical outlook that we must, we must be careful about is that there is a hidden danger of becoming an idolater when we actively pursue wealth, fame and power. Sounds a bit harsh, isn't it? Let's look at it from a Bible verse. Ephesians 5.5 5 says, you can be sure that no immoral, impure or greedy person will inherit the kingdom of God and of Christ. For a greedy person is an idolater, worshipping the things of this world. It's very clear, isn't it? Matthew 6, 19 to 21 also warns us, admonishes us and says, do not store up treasures here on earth. Treasures like money, fame, power, recognition, where moths and rust will destroy them. And it goes on to say, where, for wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. This is an implicit warning that if a person's treasure is on earth, their heart and their attention will also be on earthly matters to the exclusion of God. We can unknowingly become idolaters if we actively pursue these three elements. And so we should remember that God should and always be the only treasure we seek. Next outlook, practical outlook would be that God should have the priority and focus in our life over money, fame, influence or power. Now, some people are eaten up with selfish ambition for all of these three. Others are obsessed with their office work, businesses or their entertainment or being famous or being wealthy. For example, there can be a few of us who will finish work every day. We will come back home and we will sit before the laptop again, constantly checking for notifications if something has changed in the last 45 minutes, even though we may have finished for the day. Now, I'm not against people who have to work, who have to check if there's something, but we get into the habit of checking these notifications so much that even when we don't, we don't need to, we can become addicted there. And these kind of people, you know, the worst part is that they will remain around family, but totally lost on what's happening around them. They are interested in finding out what's happening at work, what needs to be done. The concentration is on work, 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 what needs to be done tomorrow. And their entire priority and focus can become those businesses or their offices which are giving them wealth or making them popular or giving them maybe influence over people. Matlab, pura dil or dimaag se body present, mind and heart absent, be it with their families. And the worst part, sometimes we can even do the same in the church on a Sunday. We could be so distracted from being sitting in the church, but focusing and checking our phones for social media notifications, work notifications, or just news updates. And Matthew 6.24 tells us, no one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. And this is why the verse goes on to say, you cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. In this case, money, wealth, fame and power. Where is our uh, priority? Where is our focus, brothers and sisters? Who has our focus right now? You know, success in life is not about what we do or what possessions we accumulate, but who we are in the Lord. So while we still have to go about providing for our families, we have to still save for a future for, for our kids. We still have to, uh, you know, take a part in the evangelical missions of the church to shine Jesus' light. These are all important, yes. 
but we have to learn to keep our eyes on the prize, our King and Jehovah Nissi, the banner before us. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, I want to encourage each one of us, including myself, let's have a deep longing and an active pursuance for God, just as David did in Psalm 63, 1. He says, my whole being longs for you. You know, just as a loved one is yearning for someone for his long lost love, that kind of love is what God seeks from you and for and from me. So let's actively pursue God. True worth and true usefulness or influence comes about as we learn to submit to God and to abide in Christ. As Lord Jesus himself says in John 15, 5, he says, I am the wine and you are the branches. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And God's grace is only availed for those who are or who try to be in the perfect will of God, seeking his will. God gives his children wealth, power and positions of power, those which will bring him glory, that will bring glory back to him. And he gives them so that we can live in humility as a steward over them, over what is given to us. Meaning, ek prabandak ho ke vinamrata se jina hai hume. Deenatvam kaligi baadhyatato jeevin chadam. So that we will never lose focus on who we are and how dependent we are in Christ. And Matthew 16, 26 says, For what will you benefit? It is actually the verse is pleading with you and me today. What will you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? That is something that we need to be uh, reflecting upon, isn't it, brothers and sisters? We are not worth nothing, but we do not need to prove our worth to anyone in this world, not even to our own selves. Paul Washer, he's an American evangelist and an author, and he puts it beautifully this way. He says, why would we want fame when God promises us glory? Why would we be seeking the wealth of the world when the wealth of heaven is ours? Why would we run for a crown that will perish with time when we are called to win a crown that is imperishable? Isn't it? Those are questions that we need to ponder on. Take a moment and understand what we are being spoken to today. What is on the Lord's heart today for us? Our true worth, brothers and sisters, does not arise from and is not dependent on recognition by others. We are God's children. Nothing can deny us from that. We are precious to him and redeemed by the blood of Christ with great potential in him. And this is the intrinsic worth of each one of us. And God promises us, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all else that is wealth, fame, power, uh, prestige, all of this to fulfill our purpose and role will be added unto us. Maybe you have come today here with enough of these three in your pocket and seeking God's blessings to have more. Or maybe you are here who's struggling to make ends meet, struggling and asking God, I need more. Please make me sufficient or give me enough. I do not know where you stand, but I want to encourage you today and tell you that we have a God who's Jehovah Nissi, who says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he continues to promise and admonishes us and tells us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all else. Is it wealth you seek? Is it fame you seek? Is it recognition that you seek? It will all be given unto you so that we can fulfill our purpose and role that God has set for us. Brothers and sisters, wealth, fame, power, influence, recognition, all of these are just resources given by the Lord. The question is, what do we do with them? 
I want to leave you with the verse from Joshua 24, 15. I'm sure each one of us knows this verse. It says, choose today, not yesterday, not tomorrow. The verse is directly speaking to us today and saying, choose today whom you will serve. And it goes on to say, but as for me and my house, as for me and my family, as for me and my business, as for me and my office, we will serve the Lord. In Hindi, it says, Jaha tak mera aur mere parivar ka sawal hai, hum prabhu ki hi aradhana karenge. God gives you and me the freedom to choose, brothers and sisters. Let's choose God. Let's choose grace. I request you all to stand up on your feet. Rise up as we sing this closing song together. And I want us to ruminate on what we have heard today and uh, the lyrics of the song that we are that I'm going to play as our closing song too. I want us to close our heart, close our close our uh, eyes, sorry, and and ruminate on the lyrics of the song. We all know the lyrics to this song. I want us to just close our eyes. Ask the Lord, Lord, where are we in context to wealth, fame, and power? Where is my priority? Where is my focus?